Rural voters did what the last election? The working class? When our news is reported by people far away, we get a pretty wacky version of the truth, especially the reality in the South. This is a very significant defeat. There are no obvious takeaways from what happened last night. You look at the popular vote, it's a wave. You look at the numbers, it's a wave. More like a blue ripple. That is a wave. So, a blue wave? A Trump heartland? What is the reality about what is actually going on? For more than 85 years, the Highlander Research and Education Center in Tennessee has been leading the fight for social, racial, and economic justice, as well as equality, equity, and sustainability. So it is hard to find, or even think of, people better suited to setting us straight today <laughs> than our guests. I am so pleased to welcome the co-executive directors of the Highlander Center, Ashley Woodard Henderson and Reverend Reverend Alan Maxfield Steele. It's always important for me anyway to try to check in with people who actually live in the South because the stuff that you read and hear when you live in New York, it is never anywhere close to what I actually experience when I, I leave these parts. Yes. And the fact that our media is so Northeast focused and Northeast centered is a serious problem. So. To back up a little bit, we are now in 2019. The future looks bright, of course, and full of challenge. But just to take us back a little, yeah. um, what did you make of the midterm elections? Was it a blue wave? Yeah. What was it? Yeah, I think it absolutely was not a blue wave. I think it was evidence of the incredible impact that black women's labor can have on the world, um, that when we believe in a dream, uh, that when we focus on not just catering to the center and the right, but we actually talk to our people and talk about how we can meet their direct needs, uh, that they'll believe us and they'll throw down for us. And that even if we do all that work, uh, the white right will steal an election over and over and over again. So before we get to the white right and stealing, let's go back to that black women's work. Because yeah. when I think about this coverage that we got of campaigns, um, like in Georgia, mm -hmm. around Stacey Abrams, or many more, yeah. we hear that Democrats turned out their base, mm. that Democratic activists maybe led by women of color, but they turned out their base for this candidate that everyone believed in. Are you saying that that wasn't what happened? What I'm saying is that, you know, I, if we look at primaries, right, the Democratic Party doesn't get involved in primaries, mm -hmm. right? So who Supposedly. got Stacey to the general, right? Um, who found Stacey Evans to run against her? There's 159 counties in Georgia. Stacey Abrams won 156. She beat Stacey Evans in her home district. And it took black women and other women of color saying we're committed to flanking and supporting the black women that are running Stacey Abrams' campaign. And Stacey Abrams is a black woman that we trust um, and believe in and we value her leadership. But Georgia's only one of those stories, right? Even before Georgia, the Alabama race with Roy Moore and Doug Jones, right, like that, the Democrats took a lot of credit for that as well, when what we know is that it was like Black Voters Matter. It was, uh, you know, the Ordinary People Society, Pastor Glasgow and, and Dothan. It was a multi, multi-sector coalition of black folks, particularly led by black women and formerly incarcerated people that won that fight. Mm. If you look at Florida, Amendment 4 or Gillum, right, that it was this broad black coalition and then people that are of goodwill that believe in fighting anti-blackness and fighting for black leadership that came together and made the impossible possible. And so did Democrats show up? Maybe. But was that the reason that we saw these astronomical gains? Absolutely not. Well, that let's was a hear about some movement. of the reasons why. I mean, you're well placed, Alan, both of you, to actually hear why people are doing what they're doing, not just yeah. see the pictures that we see of people in a line where we make assumptions about why they're standing there. Um, what have you heard? Why did people get so involved, whether you're talking Andrew Gillum in Florida or Stacey Abrams or Doug Jones? What's mm -hmm. the motivation? I think people are hungry for something more and more than the, what they've been getting. And I think people are remembering in this moment that there is a deep tradition of resistance in the South around a whole range of things, mm -hmm. you know, um, whether it's black liberation work, whether it's uh, poor people's organizing, you know, a whole range of things that people are starting to like really collect, collectively talk about again um, in a way that has, I think, been silenced, it's been repressed. And I think, you know, like to your point, when you opened up the conversation around media and storytelling outside of the, you know, people have been telling the story about us and for us, but we, I think folks are really getting excited to talk to each other in the South again. So that I think brings a level of inspiration for people to say, 
whether it's an electoral fight or whether it's something else, people are really wanting to get into creative solutions to the conditions that we've inherited in this moment. So I think people are really hyped. Because it speaks to me, I mean, it speaks to me about what happens next or what we might see mm -hmm. next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's what many Southerners have been saying for a long time, right? It's not that Highlander in particular is doing anything new since right. 1932, it's that we're doing it to scale and we're doing it in innovative ways, right? So I think what we're hearing in the region is like, we have to have an electoral justice mindset. We can't afford, we don't have the luxury to not, like, to throw that tactic away. So, so that split that we sometimes hear about between movement work, so-called, and electoral work, that's what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, and to be quite frank, the, the idea of the blue wave, right? It's like we're not just trying to build up a democratic party. What we're trying to do is build independent political power for our folks. Um, now, is that just you? And, and no, I think that's the movement for black lives. I think that's the Southern Movement Assembly, right? We have a whole tier of our work around building participatory democracy and movement governance. And so I think all of that is harm reduction. I think most of us are not confused that the state never has done a whole hell of a lot for us. Mm -hmm. um, I think what we are sure of is that we can't, though, afford to throw away tactics, right? When my elders and ancestors said by any means necessary, they meant by all the means. Right. Right. Everything in my tactical toolbox, because the state, the white right, those folks are using every tactic that they've got. Right. So we've got to meet sophistication with sophistication, as Willie Baptiste says, you know. Um, and I think that that means that we have to have like mm -hmm. an electoral justice project of the movement for black lives. It's got fellows all over the south and all over the country that are winning campaigns. It means uh, that we're, you know, we're beating down the doors and like doing the harm reduction work in pro progressive policy land. Um, but it also means building alternatives yeah. to the thing that's harming us. So to go back to the history for a little bit, in the 1930s when the Highlander Center was started, I think there has, we have seen a real change in how we understand the struggle. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to that period, it felt like it was a very broad agenda. When you talk about building an independent movement, it, it was also about a broad building a new South. Mm -hmm. Um, not just maybe passing a few laws or getting mm -hmm. a few people elected, mm -hmm. and yet that seems to be so often what we've been sort of shrunk back down mm -hmm. to people on the, on the, on the left or, or with a critique of the right. Mm -hmm. um, where do you stand now about where the, the lines of struggle are, and uh, particularly on economics? I mean, in the 1930s, there was an economic agenda change in mind that has been kind of studiously propagandized out of our out of our um, thinking. I think that's real. Yeah, I think when we started, it was about transforming the social and economic order, and that's the same thing we're doing now, whatever we're inheriting. And I think that when you get into the question of what the, the role of Highlander has been, has been to help people develop different kind of relationships and different kind of arrangements so that we could replicate the democratic practice that we're, lowercase d democratic yeah. practice that we're in in this particular space toward, you know, what it means to build a different kind of state or what it means to build a different kind of society. So I think that um, where the things are, kind of to your question around, like, I'm just what's thinking the like line? the 30s, the Kyland Center had people from the Communist Party, had socialists, sure. and had organized parties of the left that have been studiously wiped out, were wiped out in the decades since. And the ideas of transformation have yeah. been radically changed in that period too. Yeah, I mean, I think. I feel excited about this conversation because I think it's an opportunity mm -hmm. uh, to highlight some good stuff that I've been seeing. So, uh, you know, for example, the the West Virginia teacher strike, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So people would have said people would have said that that was impossible. Correct. They definitely would have said a wildcat strike is for right? sure, for sure. And they would have said that West Virginia's Trump country; those people vote against their best interests. They, uh, you know. B believe the myth that Trump is going to bring coal back. Their understanding of the economy is super backward. It's a monopoly, yada, yada, right? Well, they're all white people. Don't forget that part. They're all white people. White people they're all straight people. white people at yeah, that. Only straight white um, people. And yeah, and so like, look at what happened, right? And I think that what's beautiful isn't just that like these teachers said enough. In a no, in a no union, non-union state. In a right to work state, their young people supported, the families of those young people supported, the community supported. But then when the union sold out, if that's the narrative of what happened, they were like, oh no, that's not what we said we wanted. And they, they, they continued yeah. to strike. We didn't right? just want a bit for us. Right, they we're talking about the whole economic infrastructure. the whole public mm -hmm. right? infrastructure. And so I think that tells us a couple of things. One is it tells us that everything that they're telling us about Appalachia, particularly West Virginia under a microscope is not true. Secondly, what it tells me is that like the conversations that I heard, especially from the young people that were getting involved in the strike, wasn't just like, oh, I love the Democratic Party. 
or I love democratic socialism, quite frankly. It was my granddad was a UMW member and I remember him going out on strike and that's my legacy. Mine so even if they don't understand everything, all the details of like why capitalism is terrible, why like these other economic alternatives are more possible and better for them, what they know is that they're connected to a radical legacy of resistance that they're, like what Alan said, they're literally remembering what's been stolen mm -hmm. from them. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's why like, black people that were disengaged and like not not apathetic but dis, uh not hopeful about electoral work working because quite frankly it didn't it worked exactly like it's supposed to mm -hmm. to keep them disenfranchised they were like but i believe stacy and like my grandmama like waited in line for four hours like who am i to complain right, right? Mm -hmm. there's like a literal remembering that's happening with a, a new generation of the stewards of the Southern Freedom Movement. And we're seeing that rise. All right, so two questions. How the heck did you two get to be co-directors of the Highland Assembly? How did that? <laughs> <laughs> Your first interview co as co-directors. Yeah. Talk about it. Where, where'd you both fun. come from? You have so, granddaddies in the UMW? What's <laughs> no, no, I come from salesmen and preachers and teachers and uh, farmers and others. But um, no, I was politicized in the, with, by the people's movements of Northeast Thailand. It was a study abroad program that I was on yeah. during college. We had an uh, awesome opportunity to get mentorship from folks who were former student communist movement leaders in that struggle, in the struggle there. The famous uh, Thailand the Appalachia Axis. <laughs> You'd be surprised at the connection and relationships in terms of those extractive the, the, industries. The extractive industries and stories. I mean, it's pretty yeah. profound. So anyway, coming back to that, bringing popular education into my classroom when I was a school teacher in South Carolina and then neighborhood organizing in former textile communities um, brought me to Highlander through like, I wanted to find more people who were doing this other kind of stuff. And you found a longer her. story. Yeah, I found <laughs> it her. It was wild. Our, both of our first times to Highlander yeah. was at the same time, but That's we didn't right. meet um, at the 75th yeah. homecoming, That's right. um, which changed my life. I think I was there. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it was everybody. <laughs> it seems was like everybody. Was everybody. There. Like I, when people talk about homecomings, they talk about the that one. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was a big deal. Yeah. And under Pam McMichael's leadership, it was just it was a really powerful weekend. Huge. We had Pam on recently talking about surge. That's, that's right. right. That's right. Um, that's, up for cool. that's right. And Southerners on the ground. Right. Like she's she's original. Uh, she's the OG. And so uh, yeah, we were both there. We both did programs um, that came up as a participant in workshops that Highlander was offering at the time, particularly around uh, the leadership development of young people and making sure that mm -hmm. they were they were making a strategic move to get young people in kinship with each other in a very strategic way that I'm kind of for, like it's hitting right now that that's actually what they were mm -hmm. doing. And it's people that like I st clearly still throw down with. Yeah. Right. Um, and so then we got on the board of directors. I bullied him into becoming the board chair, and then <laughs> I got bullied into becoming the first black woman executive director. <laughs> lovingly bullied. Lovingly bullied, yeah. uh, which people trusted my leadership yeah. in, and I'm grateful for that. I could feel the freedom mm -hmm. all up in my bones, mm -hmm. standing on the shoulders mm -hmm. of those who came before. Mm -hmm. Ancestors be with us mm -hmm. as we march through freedom's door. Mm -hmm. I said I got a right mm -hmm. to peace and dignity. Can we snap with that or clap? Mm -hmm. And to the fullness of mm -hmm. my humanity. Kinship. I mean, this, the word is coming up a lot, and yeah. it's one of the things I think about with Highlander, yeah. too, in the sense that you see the, the, the rocking chairs are kind of a symbol of it, but people spend time together. Yeah. yeah. And they spend downtime, not just That's sort true. of at the barricades, at the picket line time. Um, kinship is often built over things you share. That's right. Uh, food. Um, but you're actually sharing something else right now, which is interesting. I've written about, but I haven't seen it, which is broadband. Yeah. Um, can yeah. you talk about that initiative, which I think also gets to this question of economic self-empowerment right. and building a new economic system? Yeah, so there's a, a task force called SEED, the Sustainable Economic and Agricultural Ag Development Task Force that's based out of East Tennessee. And they had a rural broadband campaign uh, that they started several years ago, and they had some legislative work that they were working on and really pushing hard. Um, and then there was the question of infrastructure. You know, like what does it actually mean to build our own infrastructure around internet connectivity in rural Appalachia that we clear, there's just all kinds of stuff you can read and yeah. write about around the lack of connectivity for folk. And so- Intentional lack. In, intentional lack and then corporate control of what is available. That's right. Um, so we built a tower 
on the property. We didn't make it ourselves, sure. we fabricated it, but we ordered a tower, <laughs> put it in the ground, and that tower then relays Wi-Fi uh, connectivity down to our buildings, and we're in the middle of a real fantastic experiment around it. So leveraging our own infrastructure to support other projects that will come down the road. I think what's real is like, we weren't just talking about rural broadband mm -hmm. for the people. Mm -hmm. Like we literally we li <laughs> needed, we, we also didn't have access. And the people right. in your in the valleys around you That's too. right. So will you, you eventually know, be able to offer it to them? They're already on our tower. Many, we have about, I think we've got about 60 folks, mm -hmm. or 60 residents. And, and what's the price difference? Oh man, it's significant, right? Um, so we, I can just talk about Highlander. Yep. We were paying a company that, you know, was terrible to us to the tune of like at least $800 a month just for the internet. Um, two T1s, terrible service. Um, and now I can lay in my bed at my house there and watch Netflix and answer emails and FaceTime <laughs> my niece, right? Like there's, it's, it's changed what is possible. And so and that's price? true for us. Oh, we, we, it's our tower. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think it, most people are paying like to the $80, 80s dollars range to the company that's providing our backhaul. Um, and so, yeah, and we're we're fundraising to be able to support like covering people's connectivity fees and like that kind of stuff so that all they have to do is, you know, make sure that they can pay it monthly. Does it change the neighborhood, the community's feeling about Highlander? Because at various times in history, the people around Highlander yeah. have been sort of turned against you all. Uh, right. and, and we've seen that divide and conquer work many times. Yeah, I think we're at the beginning of an experiment. Yeah. I think it remains to be seen. Yeah. Um, and I also think it depends on our commitment to organizing, you know. Yeah. Um, it's, the, if, it's great that Highlander is such a place respected and revered by people across the country and the world. Um, but if the folks in Newmarket don't know who we are, that says right. something. And if you're coming in with cheap broadband, that might be a good, good way to it's, say hello. We've definitely heard some like, oh, those that's those hippies up the hill that are got that power <laughs> up there. <now." laughs> well, it's great talking to you. You've got amazing campaigns going on, and I hope that we don't wait for another, what is it, 83 <laughs> years before we catch up with what's happening in Highlander and the, sure. the hill. Thanks for having us. You're so welcome. You, so you can get more information about the Highlander Center at our website. Check it out and find out how you can get involved. The Southern Connected Communities Project was born out of our residents' desire not only to bring broadband to rural Appalachia, but to also accomplish ownership, equity, and affordability. A wireless backbone is delivered 25 miles from the city of Knoxville to our tower via the public 11 gigahertz spectrum. Broadband is then redistributed to our communities using line of sight AC technology provisioned through ubiquity air fibers. The real power of our project, however, is the ability of our communities to own and understand this technology. In this way, this solution is a model for what a community-controlled broadband ISP could be in rural Appalachia in the South. So currently we're getting backhaul sent to this tower that we have on site, and the tower is an 80-foot tower at the top of this massive hill, um, and then we put Ubiquity's um, rocket air system, basically sending signals to each one of our buildings. And we have, I think, six buildings connected to it right now. And then we capture the signal at the office and then we, or whatever building we're in. Basically what that means is installing a dish, pointing the dish to the tower from the building and they capture the signal and put it into a Wi-Fi router in the building. We're using Ubiquity's hardware to run all of this. Um, and then we've used Unify, which is actually Ubiqu Ubiquity software to basically monitor each Wi-Fi system in each building throughout the property. So yeah, that, that's, general, that's pretty close to what we usually get. I would say on a normal day we get about 70-ish uh, download speeds and maybe 40 upload speeds. We don't we don't get taught how a lot of these things work, like how our you know how our TVs work, how our internet works, how our lights work, any of that stuff. And so it makes it seem like magic. Um, and it people don't always realize that it's something like we can understand and it's something we can we can operate. The goal isn't necessarily to. Um, to do things the fastest possible way is to do it in the way that everyone is bought in and understands what they're getting into and wants it and that it's a, a process of empowerment for everybody involved. 
Um, so our role is to, I think, to help people, not only to educate people as in just giving them information, but in learning with people. My name is DJ Coker. I'm from Duff, Tennessee, which is like at the cusp of the Clearfork Valley in Campbell County. The internet in my area is too expensive and I'm, I'm not able to afford it. Owning our own internet, that's exciting. Having it in general is exciting too, but have the ability of owning it means we can control it. We come to like the idea of owning our own and having the line of sight over fiber because um, it's more cost effective. Um, and owning your own provides jobs in the area. If the line falls, it's not gonna throw the internet out for hours or hours or whatever it takes to fix it. It's just more um, feasible for the rural area um, than fiber. When we started this um, over three years ago, we it seemed more like a dream, like just an ideal. Um, and after all our research and visiting other communities and it's um, it's a, an attainable dream. It's one that we can make come true because we, we have the knowledge, we have the skills, they're very easy. Um, so we think we can do this. We know we can do this. It's not only in rural areas like Tennessee that people are taking charge of their own media. Here's a story we reported back in 2017 from Detroit. If you're just watching the news, you would probably believe that Detroit is totally blighted and that it has uh, totally deteriorated over the past 50 years under the leadership of primarily African Americans. And at this point in time that the city is totally bankrupt, is over 18 million in debt, and that the city has to be uh, saved from itself. I think also part of the narrative has been that the city is coming back. And a lot of times what we have to educate people on is that we ask the question coming back for whom? Uh, and then we also ask the question in terms of all of the blighted properties, where did the people go? There's a lot of new development happening in the city, which is very new. It's happening rapidly. Um, and it's a little disconcerting, I think, to those that have been here um, for a very long time that have struggled without any funding, any support, and with a corrupt government. Um, it feels as though the, the development is not happening for those people. The development is actually happening for a new tax base to come in and sort of pull us out of you know, our emergency management and our bankruptcy. The thing that's pretty intense about Detroit's connectivity is um, that 40% of folks don't have broadband. Um, and then like 33% of those live below the federal poverty level, which means that even affording broadband is, is kind of impossible. The way in which we've addressed um, digital access and broadband adoption here in Detroit is through community technology. To do this work of community technology requires both community organizing and uh, IT expertise. And so Anderson Walworth here and myself have been working on um, wireless networks, learning everything we can about them, teaching several communities both here in Detroit, in New York, and around the world on how to do both the IT and the community organizing aspects of it. Anderson can sort of show you around this uh, to tell you what the routers are, what they do, and how we make um, a community wireless network. Also what the intranet is, which is where the apps live, and that's um, uh, those are resources that you can access without the internet connection. Never loved heights. I've kind of had to force myself up these rooftops for the last five years. So we're on the rooftop of Allied Media Projects. There are um, four or five routers up here. This is one of our, our nodes or one of our, our mesh routers. And this one in particular, it, it actually is off kilter. It's supposed to be pointed this way towards the hardware store, and it's not. So it's good that we came up here. I mean, the obvious thing it can do, if you hook it up to an internet connection, it will share it to the rest of the routers in the network. But another thing it can do is it can host local applications or local servers. So, um, you could host any anything from um, like a Minecraft server or um, 
like we have an app that hosts local stories and poetry from the, from the neighborhood that everyone can access on the, the network. More than half the work is the organizing part. It's just getting to know your neighbors, getting to know the local organizations, and finding other people to help support the network. For me, one of the best ways of communicating and learning about what's going on is through talking to other people. The Allied Media Conference is a nexus of that kind of sharing for us. Our role is to hold that space and to make it the most generative space possible for these types of critical connections and new ideas. I do think it's possible for media to model and, and really embody that type of exchange of knowledge across places. People should constantly be thinking about how do we create our own platforms, how do we get more of our stories out there, how do we show more and more people. I think it's a, about the infrastructure. Like what is the current ecosystem that's available for all of this to thrive in? And is there one? And if there's not one, okay, well then how do we make that happen? Or how do we make that possible? How do we plug in to maybe some other infrastructure ecosystem that's available? What does that actually mean and feel like and actually look like to do something that's collaborative and creative and successful? And what is success? How do we measure it? <laughs> in the like super long term, the end goal would definitely be to have these narratives be the ones that we're watching, the ones that people are seeing uh, across the country and across the world, and the ones that they're using to refer to the city when they're talking about what happens here.